Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for the ASC ASCP Africa Calls session. Today, we will have Dr. Roseanne Wu speaking to us. She is an associate professor of pathology at the University of Pennsylvania and also the associate program director of the pathology residency program. She practices cytopathology and thoracic surgical pathology and is a faculty member of the College of American Pathologists Ultrasound Guided Fine Needle Aspiration Immersive Learning Program. She completed her AP and CP residency and cytopathology fellowship at MGH at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And we are very excited for her to be joining us and providing us with an intro to interventional cytopathology. Please feel free to add your questions in the Q&A session. We will be saving them for the end of the talk. And out of curiosity for me and our speaker, um, it would be great if folks could put in the chat whether or not you perform FNAs um, yourself, and if so, whether you use ultrasound guidance, and perhaps about how many of those you perform each year. So we will turn off our cameras for the presentation, but we'll, we'll, we will be back for the Q&A session uh, visually for you all. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Wu, for being here to speak with us. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much to the organizers for this kind invitation to speak about one of my favorite topics, interventional cytopathology. Okay, so our learning objectives today are to describe some basic aspects of cytopathology, uh, in particular interventional cytopathology, explain the benefit of adding ultrasound guidance to pathologists performed fine needle aspirations, FNAs, and assess whether interventional cytopathology could be added or perhaps improved in your respective practices. All right, so starting with the basics, what is it? Uh, so interventional cytopathology is when a pathologist or cytopathologist obtains a cytologic specimen, as well as examines those cells under the microscope, usually using fine needle aspiration to acquire those cells. FNAs are simple procedures that are less invasive and easier to perform than core or excisional biopsy. They also tend to result in less pain and discomfort both during and after the procedure given the uh, smaller needle size that's used. They are very safe and less likely to lead to complications that are associated with more invasive procedures. And FNAs are relatively inexpensive as a diagnostic modality with less equipment and personnel involved. FNAs are rapid with the procedure itself lasting only seconds and a rapid diagnosis available only a few minutes after specimen collection and FNA accuracy is high, uh, as well, and these procedures also provide very helpful information for patient management. So FNA biopsy in its modern form came around in the 1930s, and it seems like pretty much any healthcare practitioner who has access to a needle and syringe can perform FNAs, but uh, although putting a needle into a palpable mass is pretty easy, Obtaining well-fixed, thin, evenly spread cellular smears that are actually diagnostic is quite difficult. So this is where we as pathologists have the advantage of that feedback loop between slide preparation and diagnosis to know that we're doing a good job. So an FNA of a cyst or a nodule is indicated when some tissue or fluid from that nodule or cyst could help with diagnosis or treatment. Thyroid is the most commonly sampled site for FNA, but the neck, Lymph nodes, salivary glands are also commonly targeted. Here's an air-dried Romanowski stain uh, on the left side of a medullary thyroid carcinoma. And then in contrast, here's a pap stain slide of something we don't see as often, a tenosynovial giant cell tumor of the temporomandibular joint on the right side of the screen. Uh, other sites include soft tissue as well as breast, although uh, here core biopsy is certainly the preferred diagnostic modality for breast diagnosis. There are still some situations in which fine needle aspiration may be preferable, for example, in evacuating a cyst, uh, if the patient is status post mastectomy and reconstruction, if you're dealing with a very, very small or very, very superficial lesion, et cetera. Uh, we also get requests for abdominal fat pads to look for amyloid deposition, 
And then uh, we get our handful of miscellaneous other sites, for example, the, the chess wall. So here we'll review the overall steps of a pathologist performed FNA. Start off with gathering history and review the indication for the procedure, and this could involve a team effort, including communication with other uh, providers, a review of the patient's medical records, and questioning the patient about uh, their uh, condition. Then you would perform a focused physical exam and ultrasound exam of the lesion, during which you can measure and assess the lesion of interest and determine the best patient positioning, as well as your needle approach. Usually, I will just quickly palpate or examine the nodule and then obtain consent from the patient before I do the ultrasound exam. Uh, obtaining informed consent is next, and uh, we usually talk about some of the more common side effects, such as bruising and hematoma. Um, but I've also had patients who end up having a vasovagal reaction and faint uh, following the procedure. Sometimes uh, they're able to report that sort of history uh, and reaction to needle sticks, and other times it's a surprise, unfortunately. Um, and then we also mention that uh, there is a small risk of infection every time we puncture the skin, but we can just decrease that risk by cleaning the skin with alcohol ahead of time. And then rarely, if you're doing a chest wall, uh, a breast lesion near the chest wall, uh, you can mention that there is a tiny risk of pneumothorax, but um, just recommend steering clear of uh, going through the chest wall if at all possible. And uh, if you're doing a neck FNA or a thyroid FNA, there is also a small risk of tracheal puncture, um, but usually the effects of that are fairly minimal with the patient coughing. All right, then we would move on to actually performing the fine needle aspiration with or without ultrasound guidance. And personally, I found that most cases do benefit in some way or sh shape or form from ultrasound guidance, uh, maybe except when the lesion happens to be very superficial and mobile, or when it's located in a tight spot that's difficult to get into. Uh, for example, a curved location where it's difficult to fit the probe, the ultrasound probe, as well as your needle at the same time. Next, you would uh, smear the material that you acquired in the needle and then stain those slides. And the goal here is to make every cell tell. This is a quote from Gary Gill, a well-known cytotechnologist. And the idea of this is to really optimize cytopreparation so that the cells uh, can be as informative as possible. Next, you would evaluate for adequacy and uh, give a preliminary diagnosis. And it's important to note here that counting the number of cells is not enough. Uh, anyone can look at the slide under the microscope, but not everyone can determine the significance of those slides because they may not be the cells of interest. Uh, if you're looking for diagnostic material, contamination of benign or irrelevant cells are not going to help you. Uh, once you have a preliminary diagnosis, you would then uh, triage additional material, acquire additional material as needed, and then you would move on to communicating the results, whether to the patient and or other healthcare providers. While we won't have time to go into all of these different areas in detail, I'd just like to spend some time on the equipment that you'll need, uh, the actual procedure of performing the fine needle aspiration, uh, review a little bit of smear technique, and talk about the stains. So here's a list of the basic equipment needed for fine needle aspirations. Uh, here we use nitrile rather than latex gloves, but anything to protect the skin uh, is better than nothing. Single-use alcohol wipes we use to disinfect the skin. We also use the 10 milliliter syringe to collect the specimen, and we prefer 23 or 25 gauge needles, usually either one and a half or one uh, inch size. And uh, the, the gauze and the bandages is important for just uh, holding pressure at the puncture site and um, protecting the, the puncture after the procedure. Uh, and then we have glass slides that we label with uh, the patient's full names as well as date of birth. We also add the specimen site on the label if multiple sites are being sampled. Then we also bring along rapid stains uh, and a water cup to rinse and then paper towel to blot any excess stain or rinse and some wipes to keep our counter clean in case of drips and spills. And of course, uh, the pathologist's best friend, the microscope. Then there is additional equipment which may or may not be used based on your personal preference, uh, availability of these materials or your lab zone protocols. Uh, we here at Penn, we use an ethyl chloride cold spray to help numb the skin as an anesthetic but other proceduralists may use injected lidocaine for anesthesia. This could be helpful, especially in cases where many passes are expected, or if you're using a larger needle, like if you're adding on a core biopsy. 
stress relief balls, pillows and cushions, background music. These are all kind of optional, but are helpful to distract the patient from the actual needle stick uh, of the procedure. An FNA syringe holder is helpful, especially for draining cysts, but can be somewhat unwieldy to use during ultrasound guided FNAs. And a slide box is nice to carry the slides back to the laboratory for additional processing. Uh, and then some alcohol fixative, uh, we use 95% ethanol, um, it can either be performed with a jar where you just dip the slides into the jar uh, and then transfer those to the lab, or you can use spray fixatives with ethanol or isopropyl alcohol with carbo wax, uh, with an example here in the middle uh, bottom of the screen. Then the needle rinse medium uh, could be Normasol or Cytolite for liquid-based preparations uh, if that's available, or you could use formalin if that's how you make your cytology cell blocks. Flow cytometry and culture medium are also helpful to have around uh, if available. And if you have access to an ultrasound machine, that's fantastic uh, as well. Uh, you would just need some ultrasound gel to keep with the machine and the probe. And um, disposable probe covers are available to maintain more sterile conditions, but generally is not necessary for the superficial FNAs that we perform in, in cytopathology. So here are the steps for performing the needle puncture and specimen collection. And we're gonna review these briefly, but uh, the best way to learn is to really watch videos or a live demonstration, and then to just practice, 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 and get feedback on your technique. So when you're ready to perform the procedure, make sure to immobilize the lesion with your non-dominant hand, uh, or try to pin the lesion using the ultrasound probe. You wanna clean the skin with alcohol or another disinfectant. Uh, determine the angle of your needle approach and insert the needle in a smooth and steady motion. Once you're in the targeted lesion, you have the option of adding aspiration using the syringe holder or by just adjusting your hand backwards so you can pull back on the plunger directly. Uh, then you should perform excursions back and forth within the lesion using uh, appropriate speed and number. And then when the sampling is complete, you release the suction uh, from the syringe if applicable and withdraw the needle from the lesion. So here's a pictorial view of the FNA procedure. Uh, so just to review again, you would advance the needle tip through the skin and into the center of the mass in one smooth rapid motion. Then you would apply suction and move the needle tip back and forth within the mass in short staccato strokes, about three oscillations per second. Uh, you shouldn't stay in the lesion. The dwell time in the lesion should only be about three to five seconds for your first biopsy and really never more than 10 seconds. Uh, and you should certainly stop if you see blood or material collecting in the needle hub. Cystic lesions would be an exception, of course. So if you want to uh, evacuate the cyst contents first, then you can go ahead and repeat the FNA of any uh, residual mass that remains. And then you would release the suction before removing the needle from the skin. Once you remove the needle from the patient and someone is holding pressure on the puncture site with gauze, uh, you can take the needle off of the syringe, pull back to add some air, put the needle back on, and then push a drop of material onto the slide. You really only need one drop of material and can save the rest for a needle rinse, whether you want to turn that into a liquid-based preparation, uh, a cell block, or attempt, attempt both. So once you obtain the material, you need to spread the cells on the slide, otherwise known as slide smearing. And there are many different techniques and many different methods out there. But in my practice, we use the bookend technique for thyroid and the 90 degree smears for most other fine needle aspiration specimens. The bookend technique in, involves uh, laying two slides at a 90 degree angle as shown in the left sided image applying pressure until the drop spreads into a circle, and then pulling apart the two slides straight up to create mirror image slides. Um, I have one here on the left that's stained with a diff quick stain, uh, both a picture and a real slide. And on the right side, there's a pap stain slide. So this is a really nice technique for thyroids in particular, especially if the proceduralist is not skilled at making 90 degree smears, it helps to keep the thyroid uh, material within the center of the slide rather than leaking all over uh, the slide itself uh, in bloody cases in particular. And then the 90 degree smear is our preferred way to spread the material for most other specimens. So you would start uh, with orienting the slide smear at 90 degrees with the bottom smear 
uh, with the bottom slide and use it to pick up about half of the drop of material. You then put down the bottom slide, pick up a third slide and apply enough pressure to spread the material into a circle with your smear slide. Then with gentle, even pressure, you would smear the material towards you, creating a nice oval monolayer of cells. And then you would put down the bottom slide and pick up um, uh, your other slide and do the same with the other half of the drop that was on the original slide. And then you would then end up with uh, two smears as well as the spreader slide, which could be discarded or retained if there's any material left on it. So again, smearing, it's kind of difficult to explain with words, but it's really best learned by watching videos or live demonstrations and then practicing with some feedback. And I'll include some resources uh, for videos at the end of the talk for those who are interested. So I can't emphasize enough the importance of good smearing technique. Uh, some practices to help with optimal smearing include just scooping off the blood clots uh, from the slide, whether you use the needle or another uh, slide to do that. Um, I recommend you just putting that into your rinse, limiting the amount of material smeared to just one drop because putting too much material uh, just leads to smears that are too thick and uh, applying that nice, steady, even pressure throughout the slide smearing. Uh, if there's clotted material, too much material or uneven pressure applied, whether too much or too little, the results may be suboptimal. So here's an example of a case that I think illustrates the importance of an optimal smear preparation for being able to render a diagnosis that's accurate. Uh, here's a case with four smears uh, on the left-hand side of the screen. And depending on the area that you look at, you get different results. So uh, if an area is uh, pressed a little bit too firmly, if there's too much pressure, you'll leave gaps on the slide and then the cells end up being small, stripped, kind of spread out far apart, or they're just crushed to look like nuclear uh, debris and strings, uh, as you can see in the, the middle um, top image. Um, if the smear is too thick, you might end up with cracking artifact, and again, not very good visualization of those nuclei, as well as if you have core material that's sort of left on the slide and ends up getting smeared, uh, it'll be too thick to look through. And then uh, certain areas, as you can see in the bottom uh, center picture, uh, certain areas that don't make it under the cover slip because they're at the very edge of the slide don't get covered with the cover slip, and there's sort of air drying artifact and, and uh, poor visualization of those cells. Um, but uh, in this particular case, there were a couple of areas where the smear pressure was just right, and you can see that in the rightmost image of a, a, a single cell population with a few more plasmacytoid forms, and the final diagnosis here was of a plasma cell neoplasm. But you could certainly see how it would be very challenging to make that call if you only had suboptimal preparation to look at. So once again, an optimal smear will really help you arrive at the optimal uh, correct diagnosis. Once you've smeared your slides, the next step would be to stain them. Uh, all the stains that I've mentioned here have been tinkered with and modified and varied uh, since the start of microscopic examination, and they're likely going to continue to evolve. Uh, for rapid on-site evaluation, the air-dried Romanowski stain preparation is popular, and there's at least 15 different names or variations associated with this stain. Uh, one of the best known is the Difquick, uh, the Wright Gimsa uh, is another one, or the May Grunwald Gimsa. Uh, other options for rapid on-site evaluation would be to use toluidine blue, uh, uh, hematoxylin and eosin or H&E, ultra-fast PAP, or a rapid PAP stain uh, protocol. What we do is we typically split the material into two slides as I previously mentioned. One we would use for immediate interpretation and stain it with a Romanowski stain, and one we would uh, fix in 95% alcohol uh, ethanol for later staining with the Papanicolaou stain. And when it comes to picking a rapid stain in general, the Romanowski stain does provide better image quality, but the toluidine blue stain does have its perks, uh, being that it's very fast and more cost-effective than any of the other stains. So as a recap, we went over the basic aspects of interventional cytopathology and discussed a few of the critical elements and steps. Now we're gonna move on to discussing ultrasound guidance and how this enhances uh, interventional cytopathology with attention to assessment of the lesion and performance of the FNA procedure. 
So in the past, you know, pathologists performed FNAs were performed only on superficial lesions that were palpable. And then the deeper non-palpable lesions were sampled by radiology, surgery, medicine, other, other disciplines. But now that uh, interventional cytopathology has expanded to ultrasound guided FNAs, uh, we have the ability to do non-palpable lesions as well, although we still stick to the more superficial ones. So there are several advantages to having the cytopathologist both perform and interpret the FNA. Getting the history uh, firsthand and also performing the physical exam yourself allows for more effective clinical correlation, decreases the chances that uh, relevant clinical history is missed. Uh, you can go ahead and ask the patient uh, what their medical history is directly, rather than relying on little or no information that sometimes comes with the uh, specimen. Gross assessment of the material can be very informative and can give the cytopathologist some preliminary information about the quantity and quality of the FNA specimen. The color, consistency, or even smell of the specimen can hint at certain diagnoses. For example, if you have a very dark pigmented material in a patient with melanoma, that's pretty telling. Or if you have a yellow, thick, odorous material from a superficial uh, lesion in the, in the uh, sub-Q in the skin, uh, that can be good for an epidermal inclusion cyst. Cytopathologists are very skilled at slide preparation and can offer that preliminary diagnosis at the time of procedure for each and every pass, allowing for that immediate correlation of findings with the diagnostic question and allowing for any technical adjustments for any additional passes. So uh, the cytopathologists can ask themselves, do the cells that I see match with the clinical and sonographic findings of the patient? Do these cells represent the lesion? The cytopathologist also has a good familiarity with spe specimen triage and additional testing options and can collect that material for uh, additional testing. Triage to microbiology, flow cytometry, cell block or immune histochemistry, uh, fluid chemistries, molecular diagnoses, et cetera, can be very overwhelming to those outside of pathology. So we can certainly help in that respect. Uh, fewer personnel are required if the same person, the cytopathologist, is doing the procedure itself as well as the interpretation, and this makes it more cost-effective for the health system as a whole. And overall, the efficiency of the procedure improves when it's really a one-stop shop. Uh, the diagnostic process becomes more streamlined, and uh, personally, just performing FNAs can be very satisfying and rewarding to us as physicians. So adding on the ultrasound makes all of this even better. Uh, here are some of the added steps that would be involved with using ultrasound uh, for your FNAs. You would wanna check that the ultrasound equipment is ready to use, meaning like the power is on, you're in the correct view. Uh, you would apply gel to the transducer probe, and then you would position the patient and yourself to be able to view the screen as well as perform the fine needle aspiration comfortably. Uh, then you would go ahead and orient the probe as well as the screen again on and adjust to any settings as necessary to make sure you have the best view and you're in a good spot to actually do the um, procedure as well as take a look at the lesion. Uh, you then freeze, measure, annotate, label, and save any relevant images that you'd like uh, with or without, say, Doppler um, to, to uh, review the vessels nearby. You would want to wipe gel from the area where you're going to be inserting the needle. And then you want to make sure to, to clean, of course, with alcohol and then line up the needle with the transducer, depending on whether you're going to go for the parallel or the perpendicular approach. The parallel approach, which is what's shown here in this image on the right, uh, will allow you to see the entire length of the needle during the biopsy, whereas the perpendicular approach where you would swing your hand over uh, more towards the top where that other hash mark is. Uh, the perpendicular approach al uh, allows you to see just when the needle tip enters the lesion, but does have the advantage of a shorter distance traveled through the tissue. So you would go ahead and insert your needle, identify your needle tip within the lesion, and then adjust your needle placement as, as needed. Uh, then you would go ahead and perform your excursions uh, and the rest of the FNA procedure as usual uh, for non-palpables or for palpable FNAs rather. So this was uh, the first ultrasound guided FNA case that I ever performed with our own department's uh, portable ultrasound machine. 
This patient had a prior history of malignancy, status post chemo radiation, ended up developing hepatic metastases, had a complete response to anti pdl one therapy, but now had this palpable 1.3 centimeter left neck lymph node that looked round and well circumscribed, but was taller than wide, which is a concerning ultrasound feature, and uh, had some internal heterogeneity too. So this hyperechoic area that you can see on the, the left side that kind of looks like a triangle uh, could be the fatty hilum. So you want to target the more hypoechoic areas, meaning the darker areas, um, uh, the ones that are darker than the surrounding soft tissue. Uh, on the right side of the screen, there's a different view, and the arrow there uh, indicates the needle tip within the lesion. And uh, one tip in general is to just sample the hypoechoic and rounded lymph nodes. If the patient has multiple enlarged lymph nodes, you don't necessarily always want to go for the largest uh, lymph node, which may be either uninvolved or necrotic. So here's what we saw in the diff quick stain on the left, a uh, number of uh, cells that are bigger than the surrounding red blood cells, but um, still on the smaller side. Uh, compared to all tumors in general. Um, there's not a lot of cytoplasm. I would say small to um, uh, sometimes moderate amount of cytoplasm, um, frequent mitoses, apoptoses, and very fine uh, chromatin. So, you know, looking at this, you really uh, can't be sure what, what you're dealing with. It looks like a small round blue cell tumor, uh, could certainly be a small cell carcinoma. Think about lymphoma um, on other diagnoses. Um, but if you have the prior history, then it becomes uh, pretty simple that this is morphologically uh, compatible with the patient's known Merkel cell carcinoma. And then on the right side of the screen here, I have a uh, pap stain slide of the same tumor. So while the literature on ultrasound-guided FNA performed by interventional cytopathologists is pretty skimpy and limited, most studies that are out there are focused on thyroid biopsies. So this study from Italy uh, compared diagnostic rates by different FNA performers, whether a cytopathologist, non-cytopathologist, or endocrinologist. And according to their study, cytopathologists had the lower percentage of non-diagnostic cases, as you can see here, 3.2% compared to uh, non-cytopathologists at 25.8%. Uh, cytopathologists also had a larger number of benign lesions with which life reflects both uh, just a higher rate of adequacy and uh, patient referral from general practitioners uh, at 84.5% compared to non-cytopathologists at 61.6%. And you, all, you can also see in the lower right-hand side of the table that endocrinologists had a little bit of a higher rate of suspicious or malignant diagnoses due to uh, their ability to, to select for those nodules. Uh, overall, cytopathologists also had a lower frequency of technical artifacts that were related to smear preparation as a cause for an atypical diagnosis of AUS or FLUS in the thyroid. And overall, uh, cytopathologists had a lower number of smears prepared per nodule, which is likely related, related to shorter dwell time in the lesion and less blood dilution of the specimen. 1.9 smears per nodule compared to 4.9 one smears from non-cytopathologist. There are several benefits to adding ultrasound guidance to fine needle aspiration procedures. You certainly get additional information about the lesion, whether uh, there's vascularity surrounding or within the lesion, uh, whether the lesion is solid or cystic, uh, some of that um, texture complexity within the lesion, and then its relationship to surrounding structures, uh, as well as a more accurate size um, that you can measure using the ultrasound machine. You can use the ultrasound to confirm your needle placement within the nodule and uh, not the surrounding tissue. And since palpable lesions doesn't always mean that they're superficial, the ultrasound can really help you assess the accurate depth of the lesion and make sure you're in it. The ultrasound helps you sample small, uh, meaning sub-centimeter, um, and non-palpable or vaguely palpable lesions. Uh, there have certainly been a handful of times when we get called for a palpable lesion. And uh, when we get there and we're trying to feel it, they say, oh, well, it was on imaging and in this general area. And we really have a difficult time uh, actually feeling, feeling the, the lesion itself. So in those cases, ultrasound can be quite uh, life-saving. Then you would uh, sample the heterogeneous areas 
um, to be able to get different samplings. Uh, for example, if you're dealing with a differential pleomorphic adenoma versus X, car X carcinoma, pleomorphic adenoma, you want to be sure to sample different areas of that. Or if you're trying to get the solid component or the peripheral component of a cystic or a necrotic mass. Um, um, so avoiding cystic or necrotic areas, you know, that are more likely to be non-diagnostic is something that ultrasound can help you do. Uh, and then avoiding vessels uh, to prevent bleeding, uh, any implants, for example, breast implants, um, avoiding the pleura, those can all be assisted with the ultrasound guidance. Um, overall, ultrasound guidance improves the adequacy as well as the accuracy of FNAs, even for palpable nodules. And this overall leads to a decreased need for repeat procedures or surgeries, which is going to be better for patient care, uh, lower the overall cost of healthcare, and improve efficiency. So here's another case of an enlarged right axillary slash chest wall mass that was measuring almost three centimeters in a 60-year-old man. It has the lobulated and elongated appearance of a lymph node, and it is wider than it is tall. Uh, there is some heterogeneity to the echogenicity, however, and the margins of the lesions are a little bit ill-defined. Uh, on the right side, you can see the arrow again pointing at the, the needle tip within the lesion. And here on the diff-quick stain, we see another population, another monotonous population of small round blue cells with delicate cytoplasm, scant cytoplasm. This time the chromatin perhaps looks a little more granular and we don't see uh, mitosis or apoptosis as evident uh, as in the last case. So this case was sent for flow cytometry, uh, which revealed that there was a surface kappa restricted CD19 positive B cell population uh, with low forward and side uh, light scatter plots, uh, and overall it was diagnostic of a CD5 positive, CD10 negative mature B cell neoplasm, which uh, favored recurrence or persistent involvement by the patient's known mantle cell lymphoma. So again, history very important and helpful to have. So switching gears to review another article that compared the results of 134 palpation-guided FNAs to 118 ultrasound-guided FNAs that were performed uh, over the course of over a year at this institution. Uh, in this graph on the left, the authors were able to show that there was a higher rate of getting diagnostic material on the first pass if ultrasound guidance was used. And then on the right-sided uh, hand of the screen, uh, they showed in this graph that the non-diagnostic rate was also shown to be lower in the ultrasound-guided FNA cohort, uh, only three of 118 cases, or 2.5%, as compared to the palpation-guided FNA cohort, which had uh, 17 non-diagnostic cases out of 134, or a 12.7% uh, non-diagnostic rate. So this difference was uh, found to be statistically significant. The data also indicated that the number of needle sticks or passes uh, that were performed was lower in the ultrasound guided cases with uh, palpation FNAs uh, averaging about 3.59 and ultrasound guided FNAs averaging 2.88. And I think we'd all be happy if uh, we had to do less passes, interpret less passes. And as a patient, uh, certainly they prefer fewer needle sticks. Here's another uh, case which we use ultrasound guidance, a 65-year-old female with a history of breast cancer, now with an ill-defined 1.9 centimeter left submandibular mass. This actually felt more like a swelling than a distinct nodule, and you can see here in the ultrasound image, it's hypoechoic, a little bit darker than the surrounding tissue. It's irregular in terms of its margins and heterogeneous internally. Uh, and then to the right, I've put a yellow arrow uh, at the needle tip, um, which is in the periphery of the lesion. So on our diff quick, we saw granulomatous inflammation on site, and we were able to send some specimen for culture, which unfortunately uh, did not grow anything. Um, but when we got our pap stain slides back, we saw filamentous bacteria, as you can see in the lower right-hand uh, corner of the right-handed image. Now this could be actinomyces, but unfortunately we weren't able to get microbiology confirmation. Uh, the patient was instructed to continue antibiotics for two weeks and then have repeat imaging to, to monitor. So this was a case of acute and granulomatous inflammation with filamentous bacteria. 
All right, switching gears, here is another study coming out from the University of Oklahoma that also compared palpation versus ultrasound guided FNAs. And uh, they were able to show a significant decrease in the non-diagnostic rate when ultrasound guidance was used. Uh, so the um, study uh, uh, was able to show that uh, ultrasound guidance was especially helpful in uh, head and neck cases with a uh, uh, non-diagnostic rate of 21.2% for palpation guided and only 6.6% for ultrasound guided. Um, this study also demonstrated that, you know, although you'd expect that smaller subcentimeter, less than one centimeter lesions would have lower non-diagnostic rates with ultrasound guidance, there was still a benefit to using it with larger, nodule, nar larger nodules over two centimeters. Uh, diagnostic rates were still better uh, for, for uh, ultrasound guided cases, 5.3% for those bigger nodules compared to 18.2% for those palpation guided nodules. Uh, their study also demonstrated that diagnostic discordance was lower for the group of ultrasound-guided FNA cases. Um, this was mostly due to their inclusion of non-diagnostic cases in the analysis. So as you can see here, any discordance uh, was higher in the palpation-guided FNA group, 12.8%, whereas the ultrasound-guided FNA group only had a discordance rate of 5.4%. Okay, here's one more case before we move on to the uh, last section. This patient is a 71-year-old male with a large four centimeter mass in the right upper back. You can see heterogeneous areas, some lighter, some darker, and uh, there's a layer on top that kind of looks anechoic to hypoechoic uh, and areas that look sort of variable and sort of uh, iso or even hyperechoic. Uh, on the right side there, you can see the needle coming in from the, the right-hand side into that uh, more complex area. So the FNA in the cell block showed clusters of epithelioid to spindle cells with prominent nucleoli, extensive necrosis in the background. This was a tumor recurrence at a site of prior resection. Uh, BRAF V600E mutation was requested off our specimen that was not detected. And then the patient ended up going through re-resection uh, and ended up with negative margins with no evidence of distant metastases. Uh, the resection itself also ended up being very necrotic, uh, as we could have guessed, uh, looking at the cell block on the right-hand side. Okay, so in this last section, we'll discuss some considerations regarding interventional cytopathology and uh, hopefully help you assess whether it makes sense for your practice or if there are areas of improvement that could be implemented. So some institutions do rely heavily on core needle biopsy and it's really easy to understand the advantages. Uh, when you're dealing with core needle biopsy, it's 14 to 18 gauge needles that are being used. I've shown you 16 gauge and 18 gauge needles here in the upper left-hand uh, area. You're just gonna get more tissue with uh, larger needles as compared to fine needle aspiration, which is gonna be less than 22 gauge needles, uh, showing you 23 gauge and 25 gauge here in the image. Uh, core needle biopsies, surgical pathologists much just much have, have an easier time interpreting these specimens uh, with the architecture. So they are particularly helpful in atypical lesions or if uh, uh, a specific diagnosis or a subtype is needed. Um, for example, if you're trying to distinguish uh, what kind of malignant neoplasm it is, figuring out if it's adenocarcinoma or Hodgkin lymphoma versus all anaplastic large cell lymphoma or like an undifferentiated nasopharyngeal carcinoma. These are some of the differential uh, things that we struggle with on cytopathology to be very specific uh, when we make that diagnosis. Core biopsy may be needed or have to be added in cases of breast cancer, um, for example, to assess for invasion or not. Uh, hematopoietic tumors, as I alluded to, it can be a struggle. And then desmoplastic or fibrotic lesions, sarcomas can also sometimes give you poor yield on an FNA. Uh, and then if you need material for additional studies like FISH, molecular studies, um, and uh, a lot of immunohistochemistry, sometimes core needle biopsy really uh, might be the preferred modality. But uh, fine needle aspiration certainly has its advantages too, as listed here, uh, just easier to perform, less painful, less expensive, less risky. And in some cases, performing a fine needle aspiration ahead of time might uh, decrease the number of cases that then require a core needle biopsy. 
uh, I would say also in certain cases, uh, the diagnosis can be easier to distinguish on cytologic features as well as cyto cytologic preparations. Um, for example, small cell carcinoma, I think we do better in cytopathology than trying to distinguish it on a core biopsy or trying to figure out uh, the features of adenocarcinoma versus squamous cell carcinoma can sometimes uh, be easier by uh, cytopathology as well. So we discussed many advantages of ultrasound FNA, but uh, we're also gonna talk about the, the flip side, some of the barriers to uh, implementing ultrasound guided FNA services. The training and the learning curve is probably one of the biggest barriers. Um, and just to try to uh, find a pathologist who's gonna be comfortable performing ultrasound guided FNAs and seeing patients uh, handling the complications uh, as well. The increased uh, added prep and procedure time um, is not insignificant. It does take time sometimes to set up the machine, uh, to perform the ultrasound exam, to document uh, that you're using the ultrasound exam with the images. Uh, if you have a very busy service with a lot of procedures back to back and other clinical responsibilities that you're juggling, it may be difficult to integrate ultrasound into your practice. Uh, so the availability of the physician uh, and physician time could be a limiting factor. In terms of logistics, uh, it's going to take some time to set up a procedure manual, handle any regulatory issues, uh, set up billing. Um, perhaps you need transportation, either moving the machine uh, to the patient or traveling to the machine um, for the for the uh, for the patient. Um, is there going to be physical space, uh, enough room for an ultrasound guided FNA clinic? Um, and then if the machine is mobile, is there going to be space constraints for that machine in various uh, small exam rooms? Lack of awareness by the referring provider that uh, ultrasound guided FNA is being offered could be a challenge, uh, as well as skepticism that pathologists can perform these procedures. So you kind of need to build that market acceptance for this um, to succeed. Uh, and it may involve a, a slow culture shift or a culture change um, to get folks used to sending patients to the pathologist. The cost of the equipment is certainly a barrier, uh, as well as the cost of the probe. Uh, you may want to opt for an additional monitor to be able to uh, view the, the lesion better, uh, depending on your angle and the setup of the room. Uh, you're going to need ultrasound gel, and then uh, you may want to get an ultrasound image printer as well. Um, now, when you're doing ultrasound guided FNA, there are, again, difficult uh, locations for the needle placement when you have a probe there, uh, especially around the neck and the jaw and curved surfaces, or if you have a lesion that's on the scalp with the hair covering it, um, it can very <laughs> be a little bit uh, difficult to use the ultrasound guidance. And then the there's uh, certainly politics with other physicians or in competition with other folks who may want to or do offer ultrasound guided FNA. And then uh, overall, um, you know, the desire for core biopsy as the predominant diagnostic modality, uh, that might be true for both pathologists uh, and or referring providers. So one last case to illustrate maybe some of the limitations of FNA. Here's a 60-year-old female with a 2.2 centimeter rounded cystic mass right at the, the nasal midline. Uh, this was mostly anechoic meaning all pitch black dark, but there is some debris that you can see here on the right-hand side of the lesion. Uh, and then there's the arrow with the needle coming in. So the FNA uh, on the left was signed out as descriptively uh, as histiocytes and debris without any epithelial component to evaluate. And then on resection, the case was signed out uh, as fibrous tissue and bone with central cyst uh, with bland epithelial lining. And um, there was a mention made that in the appropriate location, the origin of the cyst could be related to Rathke's cleft cyst. So while FNA diagnosis wasn't incorrect, it still uh, necessitated the surgical procedure for full evaluation and removal of the, of the cystic lesion. So if interventional cytopathology sounds exciting to you, uh, you can start by just learning as much as you can. Um, FNAs can be practiced on fresh surgical specimens with the tumor. You want to start off with uh, watching videos and maybe taking a course or work with an experienced teacher and getting feedback on your technique. But if you have access to surgical specimens or you want to make or purchase a phantom, you can practice ultrasound guidance on these. Um, you can 
have the surgical specimen with the tumor and then uh, practice your FNA technique as well as smear preparation technique uh, and get kind of immediate feedback on how well your smears turned out um, for these specimens. Uh, once you are up and going and offering fine needle aspiration service, uh, try to start with larger, uh, more palpable lesions and perform the ultrasound exam on every lesion just to get comfortable with the ultrasound machine and the, and the buttons and the controls and then start using uh, ultrasound guidance on larger palpable lesions before moving to small, more difficult ones and build that confidence. And just keep, keep at it, keep repeating, keep practicing. So uh, here in our practice, we do have a Fiona mock patient available for residents and fellows to practice their FNA technique, as you can see here on the image on the left. But you can also make or purchase less expensive phantoms to practice this as well, like chicken breast or beef liver. Uh, it does take some hand-eye coordination and practice before you get comfortable with operating and using the ultrasound machines that are out there, but it's really not as intimidating as it may seem at first. So out of these dozens of buttons that you see, you really need to know a handful of them uh, to be able to, to operate. This uh, recent study looked at different recipes for homemade phantoms on which you can practice ultrasound guided FNA and compared them to the commercially available blue phantom. Uh, they found that the ideal phantom was um, gonna be durable, simple and expensive. And, and based on their evaluation of the different phantoms, they found that the best one overall was the one to eight uh, gelatin phantom where 500 milliliters of boiling water was added to 62.5 grams of gelatin in a standard plastic storage container and uh, then they inserted the olives and the craft pom-poms um, into the mold to serve as targets and then chilled it for four hours until it became solid. So alternative to the gel phantom, uh, if you don't have all these ingredients available, could be like using tofu or chicken breast, um, but uh, a little bit messier perhaps. So now if you're building a fine needle aspiration practice from the ground up and getting started, there are a lot of logistic considerations. Uh, you need to start with a pathologist who enjoys patient contact, who has good relationship with clinical colleagues, has the skills and experience to perform FNAs, or at least is motivated to learn. Um, so when you're in the planning phases, you know how is training gonna be handled? How is quality assurance gonna be handled? What exact services are gonna be offered? Uh, are you meeting the needs that um, that uh, are, are open there, or are is there an ask? Where will the FNAs be available? At uh, multiple locations, at only one location? When will the services be available? At which hours of the day? Uh, who's gonna perform those services? One pathologist, multiple pathologists, uh, and then resources, of course. Uh, is there office or clinic space for this? Um, you know, who's gonna handle the operations and oversight of the service? Uh, is there additional staffing that's going to be needed for doing administrative work, uh, making appointments with patients uh, or with providers, handling any billing or inventory issues, payroll, etc.? And then uh, we look at marketing and publicity. Um, what's the name of the practice or service going to be? Um, is there going to be some association or affiliation with a hospital, or is this going to be an independent service? Uh, how? Would you make your clinical colleagues aware of the FNA service? How would you make the public aware? Um, would you want to develop some uh, informational materials? How would you distribute those? And then just ongoing uh, visibility and, and marketing of the practice. So a lot to think about. So as I mentioned, there is heterogeneous adoption uh, even across the, the United States at some academic centers and teaching hospitals. Thousands of FNAs are performed each year while in other places, surgical biopsy, core biopsy is still the standard. Uh, different models have been used for interventional cytopathologists in uh, places across the country. So you may have a pathologist working alongside a radiologist with the pathologist obtaining the specimen while the radiologist assists with the ultrasound machine and holding the probe. Uh, pathologists may borrow or use shared space or ultrasound equipment with other specialties like ENT, breast, uh, group radiology oncology. Uh, you may have pathologists offering an on-call service for in or outpatient FNAs where the pathologist actually travels to the patient's bedside. And there are a few practices that uh, are lucky enough to have a dedicated uh, pathologist run ultrasound guided FNA clinic. 
Um, and then there's a potential for a mobile FNA clinic that could maybe potentially travel to different locations uh, just as an unneeded basis, as needed basis. Uh, one important consideration across all of these different mo models is whether patients will have to uh, schedule their own appointments or uh, be allowed to just have a same day walk-in procedure uh, or will a combination of this be offered. So here's a review of some strategies to help launch a successful ultrasound-guided FNA practice. One main concern of hospital leadership uh, might be that this new service is going to take cases away from other departments rather than bring new cases into the system. Um, and ultimately, you know, you need to work with uh, leadership to, to make sure that this service would be complementary to other practices and uh, would enhance the overall efficiency of patient care, maybe reducing length of stay for hospital inpatients and uh, overall improving uh, patient satisfaction. So you want to start with uh, obtaining that hospital and department support, uh, doing a marketing uh, market investigation to see uh, what what um, what uh, clinicians from other departments are looking for or need in terms of services. Uh, you really want a realistic understanding of what the needs are before you go ahead and um, make this happen. Um, it helps to have seek. Uh, it helps have joint appointment in other uh, departments like surgery or medicine. And then once um, you have that support, you know, make sure that the pathologist doing this gets good ultrasound training. Um, and when offering the procedure, be flexible and say yes to every indicated request within reason. Uh, and then have that ultrasound trained pathologist, cytopathologist perform the FNAs, provide excellent service to be able to build that rapport with patients and with the clinical teams. Uh, of course, offer complementary services within pathology, including molecular testing for FNA samples, and then uh, educate patients and your clinical colleagues about uh, current medical developments related to the procedure. Okay, so. Uh, Wrapping up here, I want to uh, thank my wonderful cytopathology colleagues and fellows for making my personal work environment just so supportive and collegial. Here's a photo of our group at graduation back in 2019 and one of us at our virtual graduation the following year during COVID, uh, showing how we can all adapt to change no matter how disruptive it is. Uh, and then I want to share this quote from a review article on international interventional cytopathology. There is no one right way to do cytopathology. Each practice must adapt to the resources and limitations of its clinical environment and look for ways to exploit its strengths and work around its weaknesses. Here's my take home points that FNAs are safe, simple, accurate, fast, economical. Uh, interventional cytopathologists are well positioned to perform and interpret ultrasound guided FNAs as a one stop shop for better patient care. Ultrasound guidance improves FNA adequacy and accuracy, even for palpable lesions. And uh, it's not going to be easy, but the road to success is always under construction. Here are those resources I mentioned. Uh, seminars in Diagnostic Pathology came out with a whole issue on interventional cytopathology last year. There's some older but very useful videos by the PAP Society, uh, and then a more updated one by the uh, United States and Canadian Academy of Pathology by Dr. Britt Marie Young, a, a giant in the field of interventional cytopathology uh, that I highly recommend. And then you can come and uh, attend live workshops by some of the organizations, the American Society of Cytopathology, College of American Pathologists, and uh, USCAP. And here are my references. And with that, I just want to thank you so much again for the invitation and for your attention. Thanks so much, Roseanne and Ali. And there are some questions um, to answer. So the first is from Washington Ocheng, who is a cytotechnologist. Uh, is it okay for cytotechnologists to perform FNAs? Uh, well, in our practice, we do not have the cytotechnologists performing FNAs. However, we do uh, have cytotechnologists come for rapid on-site evaluations, assist in everything from slide smearing to um, uh, doing uh, telecytology with the pathologist. Um, in terms of the actual uh, fine needle aspiration procedure, um, they can help prepare the equipment. They can help prepare the ultrasound machine. I've had cytotechnologists come with me and help, you know, push the button to save the image um, and uh, assist me in everything uh, regarding the procedure uh, other than the needle stick itself. 
Thank you. And then at Washington followed that up with during FNA, once inside the mask, can you change the direction of the needle as you move up and down? Yes, uh, you can. So uh, uh, kind of hard to visualize this, but when you have a lesion and you're going in with the mask, you can withdraw your needle a little bit and either flatten out or uh, uh, change your angle to be able to um, get into a deeper mass or get into a more superficial mass. So you can certainly, once you're in, uh, best practice always to kind of line everything up and get in the first try. But if you need to adjust a little bit, you can certainly move the needle and adjust as needed. And then I think my only caveat to that, especially considering using ultrasound, um, is that when you have a mass that's very near a critical structure, um, you just want to maybe be less less movement of the needle and more one pass kind of thing. So if you're really close to the jugular or you know some other major vessel or artery, I think you want to be a little bit cautious. But outside of that, you know, you, you can move around as as Roseanne said. Um, Alex, yes, Alex, we will share the recording, and um, because Rose had those great um, links, I can pull those links out and share those in an email. Uh, so I have her slides and I can do that. He also, Alex also wants to know, uh, how do you assess the sample adequacy? So we, uh, we actually have a microscope um, kind of scattered throughout all the different areas where we do find needle aspiration, everything from a microscope on a movable cart um, that we have <clears> to find a, a plug for to, um, you know, microscope stations set up around the clinics. But, um, you know, we do our diff quick stain uh, usually at patient bedside or back in like a, a rear room. Um, we tell the patient we'll be back in a few minutes, you know, with a preliminary result and we'll also communicate with your physician. Um, and so we'll go to the back room, we'll stain the slide, look at it under the microscope and um, be able to render um, a, a rapid diagnosis at the time of the procedure. Uh, usually we'll do maybe like two passes up front with the patient and then take those two passes to the back and, and see what we have. Um, like I said, gross assessment is really helpful in these cases because sometimes you go in with one pass and it's great material, it's not too bloody, and you can stop there and go take a look. Um, you know, sometimes it's blood and you need to readjust your technique or, or rethink, um, you know, whether, whether what you have is representative. But yeah, we're lucky enough to have a microscope available to us in, in multiple locations. Perfect. Um, and Advera in Gaza says, is it okay for a radiologist to perform an FNAC? Yes, um, I don't think um, there's any restrictions on um, any physicians performing fine needle aspirations. Uh, radiologists in our practice are usually the ones who perform them, the interventional radiologists. Uh, not every radiologist is going to be comfortable or trained to do it, however, so um, kind of depends on your local situation. Great. Um, and then Washington Mudini in South Africa asks, thank you for a very informative presentation. We need to change our attitudes of adopting this tool, especially in the areas where histology is not readily available. Yeah, absolutely. It uh, takes a lot less resources, I think, to get together um, some of these uh, cytopathology preparations. Uh, you really don't need a, a full-on lab if you can uh, have access to a microscope in some of these stains. Um, a lot of folks, you know, don't necessarily do the whole uh, Papanikolaou stain. I think a Romanowski stain does a great job once you get used to interpreting those for rapid on-site evaluation. Uh, we have a very low discrepancy rate between our on-site diagnosis and uh, our final diagnosis once we do have, you know, all of those additional preparations. You can do a lot with a little. That's the beauty of cytopathology. Um, and Alex also asked, can you comment briefly on the use of cell blocks, which we have had a session on cell blocks, but can you comment on cell blocks in context of what you talked about today? Sure. Well, uh, for ultrasound guided FNAs, I, I definitely do feel like we get more material when we use ultrasound guidance and more material means a higher likelihood of getting a cell block. Um, we're lucky enough to have access to a couple of different methods. We use like a traditional cell block where you spin down into a pellet and embed that pellet. Uh, we also have access to the salient cell block machine, which is really nice for uh, those lower cellularity specimens in capturing individual cells and smaller cell clusters. So uh, even if we can't get a pellet, we uh, put all of our uh, non-gyne FNA specimens through the salient machine to try to, to, try to get us um, some tissue to be able to do IHC if needed, for example. Great. And then I think uh, George, uh, who is from Ethiopia, says, thank you, Dr. Roseanne Wu. Is there any recommendation 
for ultimate ultrasound machine interims of high definition, for example, 2D, 3D, et cetera, please? Uh, we just use the, the basic 2D <laughs> in terms of um, the ultrasound machine, yeah. Uh, awesome. We are certainly not radiologists. We're not trying to issue any diagnostic reports here. Um, it's we're just using it for needle guidance. I know uh, there are some very high-end machines out there which can do all sorts of very interesting reconstructions, et cetera. But um, you know, just a simple laptop portable ultrasound machine, or even now there's a lot of handheld units that are uh, perhaps even less expensive, uh, which are getting better and better every day, um, are just suitable for for needle placement. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been great. Uh, Dezizo says thanks for a great presentation. Ali, thank you for doing the introduction, and I apologize for having to be on another call. Um, wonderful session, really great presentation. Hope everyone enjoyed it. We will send out the recording uh, so that you can watch this at any time or if you missed it, and I will pull out uh, Roseanne's links uh, that, that she had that were live and put those in the email so you don't need to dig those out of the recording. Um, I believe our, I'm not sure when our next session is, but I think it's in a month. Is that right, Allie? We have something next month. I'll have to look. I'll so look. That's uh, okay. I'll send out the recording and I'll send a reminder from our next session. But thanks everyone so much for joining us. And we are at time uh, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. So much, Dr. Wu. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Bye. And Allie, you'll need to end it. <laughs>